Hey everyone, I hope you, uh, hope you brought your Bibles. If you didn't, um, it's really important if you could bring those every day. I should have said that last night. I so- sorry about that. But uh, if you did bring your Bibles, please turn to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. Like I said this week, um, my plan is that we'll go through and look at various characteristics of godliness. What the picture of a godly person is in the scriptures. And there are a lot of different places we could go. We could look to a number of examples in the scriptures. That's what we're going to do this morning. We could look at just passages that teach us certain things, instructive passages. And and we'll do a little bit of that this week as well. Um, There are all kinds of places we could go. But this morning I want to look at a particular example of a particular individual in the Old Testament uh, by the name of Ezra. What I'd like to do, I hope you're there, Ezra 7 is I'd like to read verses 1 through 10, and then I'll pray, and we will uh, look at it more closely together this morning. This is Ezra chapter 7, and this is the Word of God. Now, after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Mariah, son of Zeruiah, son of Uzi, son of Buki, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the month he began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we have sung of your holiness, and we do recognize that this morning you are different from us. You are our creator. We are mere creatures. We thank you for revealing Yourself to us in Your Word, we confess that if You had not done this, we would really be in the dark in so many ways. So we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that Your Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray that You would take Your living Word by Your Spirit this morning and use it in our hearts to convict us of sin, to train us in righteousness, so that we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So the first uh, individual that I want to look at this week is this man named Ezra. And I want to give you a little background of it. There's some background given in verses 1 through 6, a kind of genealogical list of who Ezra was. And we're not going to go through each name in there. Although I, I would say this, if you just, when you're reading your Bible, if you just kind of pass over the genealogies, you're probably uh, doing a disservice to the text. The names are there for a reason. Uh, There are some things we can learn from them. In this case, though, I want to just highlight one particular thing about Ezra, and that's this, that Ezra was a high priest in the line of Aaron. If you go to the end of the genealogy in verse 5, you can see that. You can see that Ezra is a descendant of Aaron, and, uh, and, and, and so he is rightly the high priest of Israel. But, but you also see this, that Ezra, his, his high priestly ministry was going to be a little different from Aaron's or from many of the others who are mentioned in this list, because it says in verse 1 that Ezra was doing what he was doing in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So the situation is this, the situation is that Ezra is a high priest by right and in terms of his genealogy, but Israel is in exile at the time. They're not living in the land that God had given them. There's there's not a temple for them to go to to worship. There aren't all the kinds of normal things that are portrayed in the law. So Ezra's a high priest, but he's a high priest in exile. 
Now, if we dig a little deeper into what this looked like for Ezra, we really find some remarkable things. Some of them aren't mentioned in, the, in these verses, but, but some of them are in the surrounding context. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about what Ezra accomplished in exile. You would think he would be sort of out of a job, but in exile as the high priest. So one of the things we see Ezra do is we see Ezra lead this incredible revival of God's people. There's this moment where we see Ezra open the scriptures and really explain them to the people in such a way that they repent of their sin. Ezra is the author, the human author of this book that we're reading and probably also the book of Nehemiah and probably also the books of First and Second Chronicles. So that's a pretty significant accomplishment. Um, in fact, some people attribute the formation of the entire Old Testament canon up to the time of Ezra to Ezra himself. Not that he wrote it all, but he kind of pieced it all together and preached it to the people. Um, his, his, his teaching and his writings on the scriptures were so influential that in the, uh, in the Jewish tradition, they called him the second Moses. And then... Um, in this particular case, what we're going to see is that Ezra leads the people from Persia, a certain group of the Israelites from Persia, back to Jerusalem. So he has this incredible resume, if you will. He has this incredible list of accomplishments. And, and you might sort of ask, if you met someone like Ezra, you might, you might wonder, well, where, did he, where did he go how did he learn all of this? How was it that he was able to accomplish all that he was able to accomplish, even in the midst of being in exile and, you know, by all accounts, having it look like there really wasn't going to be much for him to do? In other words, how did Ezra do what he did? Uh, you know, you might have had this experience before. I have a lot of students who are prospective students who come into my office and, and what they do when they're sitting down and kind of deciding about colleges, and maybe, maybe some of you are at this point, is they, they sit down and they go, okay, this is what I want to do at the end. And, and so because this is where I want to get to at the end, how, how do I do that? What should I study? What kind of place should I study in? What kind of teachers should I surround myself with? In other words, they, they, they have this idea about what they want to get, where they want to get to, and then they try to figure out how to do that. And if you were to stack up all the things that Ezra did, all the things that he accomplished at the end, you, you, might, you might say, well, how did he get there? What did he do to reach that point? And actually, what's really interesting is, at two different points in this text I read for you, the, uh, the, the Bible's really clear about how Ezra was able to do all that he was able to do. And you see all that he's able to do, even just in this little text. It says in verse 7, he went up to Jerusalem. He took the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple servants. This incredible act of leadership on Ezra's part. In fact, if you, if you look at how quickly he did it. It says that he began to go up, this is in verse 9, from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. He made the journey with all these people, all these musicians, all these temple servants in this remarkable amount of time. So how did he do it? How did he get to that point? Well, there are two places in the text where it gives us, the, the in a sense, the how-to. How, how did Ezra accomplish this? And, and the first thing that it says in verse 6, this is actually repeated twice, but you see it in verse 6, is really something very clear. It says, uh, the king granted him all that he asked because, this is the very end of verse 6, because the hand of the Lord his God was on him. And then if you look at the end of verse 9, it says, for the good hand of his God was on him. In other words, when you look at all that Ezra accomplished, all that, all that you know, his, his resume entailed, one of the things you have to say, and Ezra says this consistently, is that the only reason I was able to accomplish any of this, the only reason was because God's good hand was upon me. In other words, you will not find 
either coming out of Ezra's mouth or coming from the pages of Scripture, you will not find any point where it says, you know, Ezra was able to do this uh, without God. Ezra was able to accomplish these things uh, because of his innate skill, uh, because he, he was just such a, such a dedicated person. What you find instead is consistently it's God's hand that was upon Ezra. So you need to think about this a little bit as you, as you think about your life, as you think about where you're headed, as you think about maybe what you'd like to see happen in your life. You need to recognize the fact that the Bible is very clear that the good things that we accomplish in life, the things that really last, the things that really matter, the things that will matter, you know, we talked last night about a thousand years from now, the things that matter a thousand years from now are things that God does in and through us. So then that should kind of push you to a second level question, which is, okay, how is it that God works through people? What kind of people does God work through? Because we know it has to be God's hand upon us. And actually, Ezra, this little text gives us an answer to that second level question as well. How is it that God works through the people that he works through? And that actually comes in verse 10 in Ezra's case. Here's what it says. I'll read the end of verse 9 again. The good hand of his God was on him because, verse 10, because Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. I want to take each of those three items that are mentioned in order because they're each really important and the order is really important. The first thing it says about Ezra and, and in a sense why God's hand was upon him as a leader of God's people is because he set his heart to study the law of the Lord. Now, now this, this term that he set his heart to, to study is, is, this, is this idea of really inquiring after something, seeking out something, in a, in a diligent way. It's, it's sort of the idea of digging in in order to get out what's there. That, that was what Ezra did when it came to the Scriptures. That's what sort of shaped Ezra's life. If you want to know what Ezra would be like if he were standing before us today and we were talking to him about all the things that, that he had done, first thing he would say is, it was God's work from beginning to end. And then if he said, but Ezra, what, what have you dedicated your life to? He would say, well, I always made it a priority to dig into the scriptures, to study them in order to understand what God had said. So think about this with your own life. Think about where your priorities lie. Think about what you spend your time doing. And then think about how it is that you approach the word of God. Do you approach the Word of God with that attitude? Many times I meet uh, students who have grown up in Christian settings, and they do. They read their Bible, but they read it in a, just in a, a very superficial way. Maybe they read it because they feel like they need to read it every day, and so they'll read it for a few minutes a day, and sort of you could ask them 10 minutes later what they read, and they wouldn't remember, because it's a very superficial kind of reading. That's not the kind of reading that Ezra is doing. Ezra is seeking out what God's Word says. I'd be very curious this morning, I'm not going to do this, but I'd be very curious if I gave you a, a quiz on different kinds of trivia. Maybe, maybe if you're, uh, many of you are mu obviously musicians, if I gave you uh, questions about music, or, or if you like sports, if I gave you questions about sports, or, or other kinds of things that are your interests, if I asked you questions about that, whatever your interests are, I, I'm pretty sure you could answer many of those questions. But how does that stack up to your understanding of the Scriptures? Ezra's leadership, Ezra's accomplishments were framed by his understanding of the Word of God. And look at how broad that was for him. That enabled him to do all the things I outlined, it also enabled him to give leadership to these priests, to these people in verse 7, to these Levites, to these singers, 
to these gatekeepers, all these various people who were involved in worship, Ezra was able to provide leadership for them. Why? Not perhaps because he was as great a singer as all these singers were. That wasn't his vocation. But he knew the word of God. And so, and so they were able to follow after him. He sought out the word of God. There, there are a number of places where this idea is mentioned and maybe the most uh, prevalent place it's mentioned is in Psalm 119. If you've ever read Psalm 119, you know that it's the longest chapter in the Bible, the longest psalm, and it's all about the Word of God. And it says things like this, um, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek them out with their whole heart. It's the same word that's being used here. With my whole heart I seek you, the psalmist says, let me not wander from your commandment. Could you say that kind of thing? Could you could, if, could someone look at you, put you up here, and say this is a person whose life is framed by the study of the Word of God, who, who really is thinking biblically, is looking at his or her life biblically, and is eager to seek out the things of God in the Scriptures. The second thing, the second thing we see with Ezra here in terms of the explanation for his ministry in verse 10 as well, is Ezra sought to study the law of God, and then look at this in verse 10, and it says, and to do it. Now this is kind of another step forward. Ezra's digging into God's word, and he's digging into God's word with real dedication, not a superficial reading, not something that's just kind of in passing, not something that he knows very little about, but something that he knows a great deal about, He's seeking it out with his whole heart, and he's also giving his heart to doing God's word. This is so important. You know, in the book of James, it talks about this. Uh, James says that don't merely be hearers of the word and so deceive yourselves, but be doers of the word. In other words, there's a way in which you can study the scriptures and study them with actually real diligence and listen to them carefully and, and hear what God is saying. But, but actually, that can be a kind of self-deception, James says. You can deceive yourself by thinking, yeah, I, I actually do know a great deal about the Bible. I actually have studied it pretty well. I actually probably could answer many of the questions you'd ask me about the scriptures. But if you're not also committed to obeying the scriptures, then James says, you're just kidding yourself. You're lying to yourself. You're walking away feeling self-satisfied as if you've done what the Bible has said, when really you've ignored what the scriptures have said. See, Ezra was someone dug deeply, studied hard, but in order to do it. It's really interesting because when Paul gives instructions to pastors and, and elders, one of the things he says is this. Uh, he says, watch your life and doctrine closely. And that order is really striking, isn't it? He's really concerned that they watch their doctrine, of course, but that they also watch their life. As you think about your life, as you think about your actions, as you think about your words, as you think about your attitudes, I want you to think about how those line up with what the Scriptures actually teach. Are you setting your heart not only to study God's Word, but also to do God's Word, to obey God's Word? There's this one commentary that I read about this passage, and, and he captures something really significant about Ezra. Again, if Ezra is one of our pictures of godliness up here, here's what he says about, about Ezra. He says, the model teacher in Ezra is a doer, and the doer can be no mere demonstrator. He must be what he wants his students to be. In other words, Ezra's leadership over all those people 
wasn't just because he knew the Word of God, it was because he did the Word of God in his actions, in his private life, in things they saw, in things they didn't see. Ezra had committed himself to doing God's Word. Don't deceive yourselves. Third thing that it says that Ezra set his heart to do is to, to study, to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Now, here's a place where maybe Ezra, Ezra's life is going to be different from, from your life. Ezra really did have that vocation of being a teacher. He was the high priest, and one of the things that priests did is they taught. They taught the Bible to Israelites. They did their sacrificial things, but that was really just a small percentage, even when the temple was there. It was just a small percentage of what they did. Most of what they did was they taught people. They taught people the Bible. So we have pastors today who teach the Word of God, and that's some, something like what uh, someone in Ezra's position was doing. So in one sense, of course, Ezra's teaching responsibility, his teaching vocation, might be different from, from ours today. But I want to be careful with that because, you know, one of the things that is also really clear in the Scriptures is that those who study God's Word and those who do God's Word are also supposed to be able to talk to others about God's Word. It may not be formal teaching as it is in Ezra's case because of his particular situation and his particular vocation. But remember what Peter says? Peter says, always be prepared. He's talking to everybody, all Christians. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. So that's a kind of, that's a kind of teaching. Here's Ezra studying God's Word, doing it while people are watching and people aren't watching. And then also he's prepared to talk about it. So many times we have Christians who are kind of covert about their faith. They may actually study God's Word. They may actually try to live their lives in obedience to God's Word. But if, if ever something comes up, they don't want to say anything about it. That wasn't Ezra. Ezra knew that this had, this had to have a public face to it. There had to be a public aspect to his faith. Now again, how that looks may vary from situation to situation. And in this case, Ezra's model isn't the model of all of us. But the fact of the matter is he knew that it had to go even beyond studying, even beyond doing, it had to actually get to what he said to other people. That's such a critical component, too, of our lives today and what a godly life today is supposed to look like. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the, the most important thing to remember in all of this is what Ezra says, because it's very interesting the way this whole chapter is laid out. I didn't read the whole chapter because it was too long for our time together, but it's really interesting the way this whole chapter is laid out because it says God's hand was on Ezra because, you know, he did all these things. He studied, he did, he taught. But when Ezra is asked, this is so interesting, when Ezra is asked later on, about why these things happened, why he had this success. What Ezra says is, God did all of it. This is the kind of interesting paradox related to everything we're going to look at this week. There are models in the Bible, there are clear teachings in the Bible about what the picture of godliness is. But one of the things that we have to remember when we look at all these pictures, whether today, all the way through Friday, when we look at these pictures is this, that ultimately, godliness is something that if we are growing, it's something that God is doing in and through us. It's a work of God's grace. The Christian life is a work of God's grace from beginning to end. You don't get right with God because you want to kind of clean yourself up one day. It's God, by His Spirit, working in and through us to transform us into the image of His Son. Ezra knew that. 
So when Ezra looked back at his life, looked at his resume, had people ask him questions, Ezra, how'd you prepare to do all these leadership things that you did? Ezra said, it's all God's work. Now, if you looked at Ezra's life, you'd see him doing these things mentioned in verse 10. So we can learn from that. But ultimately, Ezra knew this is a work of God and a work of God's grace. So that at the end of the day, while Ezra is our model, ultimately, God gets the glory for his life, for your life, for mine as well. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this first picture of godliness, studying your word, being careful to do it and to teach it. We pray that you would teach us through this and that your grace would be as alive and active in our lives as it was in the life of Ezra. Thank you for this opportunity this week. Be with us, we ask, in Christ's name. Amen.